Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome serial entrepreneur and aviation innovator, David Neeleman, to the Reboot Chronicles. He is a founder of multiple commercial airlines, including Azul, Brazil's largest airline, which I think transformed the, company, the country's travel as well as the logistics network. WestJet in Canada, some of you have flown that. Morrison Air, which you probably don't remember, he sold to Southwest. That was a, one of the first big deals. JetBlue, which broke some of the records of the fastest growing airline in the U.S. And most recently, Breeze Airways, where he is chairman and CEO. I like David because beyond aviation. He's also kind of a tech guy. One of uh, many of you out there who kind of uh, watch this industry, he developed one of the first programs for um, online booking called uh, Open Skies, where he was at Morris and Southwest. It was the first e-ticketing system. So he sold that. It's now running multiple airlines on the back end, which is pretty impressive. But really the news story with him is kind of responding to this huge decline in regional flights, which many of you have suffered through. A lot of markets have been left behind or um, by the big three. And David saw an opportunity to reboot the travel industry for the fifth time. (laughs) Um, So now Breeze operates over 150 routes in dozens of cities and into just two years, not a lot of time here. Breeze has already been ranked as one of the country's best domestic airlines by Travel and Leisure magazine. So David, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Great to be on your show. Yeah, the, the fifth time is a charm, I guess. Is that the slogan we're going to go with? And maybe I'll make that the headline of the show. I mean, I mean, I, I'm as a serial CEO, tech companies mostly, you know, I've run dozens of companies, but I usually step in and, you know, taking over for the founders or just jump on the board to help as the growth guy. But you've actually started them from nothing and scaled them up. And to me, that just takes a lot of courage. So I thought I'd open up with a question, maybe take us back to 2021, you're sitting in the Tampa airport and you launched the first Breeze Airways flight. How did you feel that day? Yeah, it felt great. It was it, it kind of in the middle of COVID still, uh, kind of at the tail end. And, and, you know, people had been locked down for a long time and the certification process was actually challenging, you know, because a lot of the FA people were still in their homes and, and a lot of our people <laughs> yeah. were too. They were scattered across the country. So yeah. it, it was, it was great to get going. Uh, but you know, it's happened before, you know, I've done this many times, but anytime you can, you know, build something that people really value, be, be it the, the, the people that work for you or those that fly on you, it's, it's really gratifying. Yeah, you're like a perfect example of the business model canvas that we teach at Kellogg. I'm sure you've taught it at Stanford and other places too. Um, maybe a basic question. Who's your target flyer? Business travel, consumer, infrequent? It's kind of all of the above. You know, we're obviously more leisure, more VFR. You know, there's been a displacement of people that have kind of moved from the Northeast to the Mid-Atlantic region. Yes. So we're big, in, we're big into Charleston, South Carolina, and a lot of people, you know, flights from Hartford and Providence and, and Islip and those, those areas. So I, I think, you know, and I think COVID just kind of made that even more uh, pronounced. You know, there were more people were moving, more people are working from home. Uh, and even this move to go back to the office, which is great, uh, there, people are kind of negotiating. Okay, I'll work three days a week or four days a week. Fighting, so, fighting would be a better word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think Fridays are kind of a home, and Mondays are kind of a home, and people can fudge that a little bit and get away. Yeah. And so you know, every weekend's kind of a holiday weekend nowadays, which is a little bit different. But we, you know, we do a lot of leisure, but we're not opposed to. To flying a corporate shuttle. I mean, if somebody calls us and said, "Hey, I got a call yesterday, actually from a huge company," and and said, yep. "You know, we we have a lot of people going between these two cities. We can't get there nonstop. Uh, if we guarantee a certain amount of revenue per month, uh, yep. can you fly it for us?" And I say, "Yeah. What times do you want? And how much will you pay? And and we can sell it too. So you know, we're we're, we're flexible, and we do tons of charters. We in the first quarter, yeah, that's, that's why I asked you." Yeah, we ran fourteen hundred charters for we're if not the Whoa. big one of the biggest NCAA basketball for men's and women's NCAA basketball. So 
we do that as well. So we're, you know, we're, there's just a lot of opportunities. As you said, that a lot of cities have lost service. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. It's that sad, actually, yeah. 75% of all the cities in America have lost air service. And 123 cities have lost more than 25% of their air service. And so that's that's a huge opportunity for us, and we're trying to fill it as quickly as we can. Yeah, even this year, some of the big three have announced pulling out of some of the tertiary cities, as they call them. But, you know, I began my career at FedEx, and, you know, Fred Smith was uh, one of uh, my mentors. And, you know, he didn't invent the hub-and-spoke concept, but he kind of did. He pretty much perfected it. The airlines perfected it again. And now, as you like to say, we're all forced to go through hubs. So you're you're back to the point-to-point system, similar to Southwest. Do, do you see that? staying or as you grow this is from an innovation perspective but as you grow you know the the southeast brilliant timing by the way everyone's down here you know we're the reboot chronicles headquartered in florida here everybody's back and forth right to the east coast so your your positioning is great do you, do you ever see that changing a little bit doing maybe a little hub and spoke uh you, you know we will do some of that obviously we we, we do what we call breeze throughs so you know, kind of into the peak season, we may do Providence nonstop to LAX. And then maybe during the off season, we'll stop at, do a quick stop in Cincinnati or, and, and, and sell both Cincinnati to Providence and LAX. So we, we kind of move the fleet around a little bit. Sometimes we get a little bit of, hey, I was just loving this flight and you moved it. And I said, well, come back in three months. You know, <laughs> you know it's just what we figured out the people in Providence yeah. love to go to the mid Atlantic. They love to go to Charleston in the summer, but then they come do. winter. I mean, they'd rather they'd go to rather go to Vero Beach, and they'd rather go to Fort Myers, and so we do a little bit of shifting. But you know what, what's happened is that you know with these pilot salary increases, you know what you know we're paying twice as much as we as we started out paying just two years ago, right? And and that's good because I mean we have a hundred and thirty seven seat airplane, but you can imagine on a fifty or seventy four seat airplane. You you double the salaries on that. It just you know, really on the fifty seat particularly it, it destroys the economics. So I think you're going to see a lot less uh, flights from the regionals, and it's already come down. It peaked at about a million flights a year, yep. and this year it should be about four fifty. So I've lost five hundred thousand flights, you know, in the country. And then as the airlines, you know, as as the big airlines you know, salaries have gone up too, they've gone to bigger and bigger airplanes. They've gotten rid of the seven thirty seven, seven hundred, the three nineteen, the three twenty is even being replaced by the three twenty one. So you get these mammoth, you know, bigger, bigger airplanes. Uh, then they have to. It doesn't make sense to fly from Huntsville, Alabama, to Las no. Vegas yeah. or Huntsville. So Huntsville's, a, so Huntsville's a big. That's a, a booming area. It's well, booming. It's up. It's up twenty five percent in population, and the air service is down twenty five percent. It's amazing. And it's either fly to a hub or or drive yeah. to, to to Nashville. I was looking at going to a friend's wedding uh, in the fall, and so I looked at you and I looked at JetBlue. You know who goes? I don't want to go into Newark and do all that stuff that I normally do with United. And so I was looking at both of them. And what I've noticed with some carriers, including you guys, it's it's only a few days a week. So it's like you've got to. And it, it's really tuned to the weekend traveler, as you've said. Do you, do you do you expand that as demand goes up? You start adding dailies, or how, how do you how do you innovate through that? Because I, I realize you want to be a for profit airline, like everyone else wants to be. So yeah, uh, we, we get it. We get profit here. It's not a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know when I was at JetBlue, uh, we made all the we worked really hard in July and August. Yeah, and we made all this money, and then we lost it all in September. <laughs> so exactly, you know, you, <laughs> it's like, my friends at United said this years ago when when I think when Oscar took over says we want to stop being a nonprofit airline. We we, we don't want to be yeah. donating money anymore. And so so I had the same thing on days a week. You know, you make money on Thursday and Friday, and Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then you lose it all on Tuesday and Wednesday. So you know, we we do fly Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and some some markets we do have daily service. Uh, you know, Westchester to Vero Beach this winter will be daily, actually some uh, two days a week. Uh, Provo to Orange County, we fly two days, uh, two times daily and uh, on peak days and, and one time daily. So it just depends on the market and it depends on the time of the year. Right. Uh, you know, we find if we try and push it too hard, then we don't make money. And, you know, people just say, well, I can go Thursday, Friday and I can come back Sunday, Monday. That's fine. I don't care if I, you know, if it's on a Tuesday, Wednesday and then. Yeah, absolutely. You got to funnel it. Sure. 
What's interesting is that, you know, a big percentage of our flights are one way. So I think people are saying, okay, I'll go down nonstop on you and then I'll come back, one, you know, through a hub the other way. But at least I don't have to do it both ways if it doesn't fit with their exact itinerary. That is so funny. That is what I ended up doing on this wedding trip. <laughs> Got some business. Anyway, um, so what do you, uh, when you, when you look at the, I don't know, getting profitable, a lot of obstacles here, you know, the economy, you mentioned, you know, people shortages, all types of things don't get us started on fuel costs. And um, how do you, I mean, how do you, so the guest before you was the CEO of Reach TV. They have all the TVs in the airports now, entertaining mm-hmm. people while they're waiting, so to speak. And eventually they'll be in airplanes as well. But, you know, what, one of his takeaway lines was like, hey, if you're not in for a five to seven year fight, you should not be operating a startup. So what's the trajectory look like when you look out five years? Where, where, do, you want, where do you want the company to be? And, and what's the formula to, uh, you know, repetitive uh, profitability, going public, that kind of stuff? Well, we've got 31 airplanes today and, and we have 120, uh, 220s on order. So they're, so we have, we have a lot to go. And, and, you know, what, one of the things that we haven't done yet is we haven't uh, received what's called our flag status, which allows us to fly international. Right. Uh, we'll be doing some char- some, some one-off charters uh, in the fall, uh, international and then hopefully by the end of the year we'll be able to start scheduling international so that's that's a big market i mean the 220 the reason uh, we selected that airplane was really for three reasons uh number one it it's got it's great on short field so we can go out of uh, airports um like key west or hilton head and places like that and we can nice. get off the ground really quickly <laughs> uh, it also is great for fuel economy uh you know we what we burn per seat is 20% below what the other guys burn per seat. And so our right. trip cost is really low. And it's uh, a good so long haul too. You can go to Europe. And then it's, we can go, uh, you know, seven and a half hours. We can go yeah. to Hawaii. Uh, when we get that, you know, when we get that certification, we can go deep into central and South America from, from Florida. Uh, we can go, we can go from the Northeast and, you know, kind of up to Ireland and in part of the British Isles, we can do that. So that's flexible. And then we have a, it's really conducive to a premium cabin because you have two and three seating. You know, there's only one middle seat. So if you go two and two, you only lose one seat per row. So it allows us to charge less for a first class seat than you would see on like a 737 or an A320 where they have three and three and they have to eliminate two seats to be able to accommodate a first class section. Right. And the cabin's wider, so it's a really, really comfortable seat. So those are those are the main reasons we picked the 220, and it's really conducive to this this thin, long, thin flying, where uh, we we can get you there nonstop, and you know we really want you to get you there twice as fast for half the price. That's kind of what our <laughs> mantra is. Yeah, I think one of your lines was the hold time on some airlines is longer than our flights. So, um, but. What, so let's switch to loyalty. Um, you know, we look at loyalty programs, you know, with United and with United, I've been like global services with American. I was concierge key back in the day. So that's their premier unpublished tiers where they babysit you. Um, what, what, I mean, that this all started in the eighties, the loyalty um, programs just shifted the entire industry and it, and it worked. It really paid off. There's been a lot of fighting about whether it should be taxable or not. But uh, over the years, it's really drawn people together where, you know, your employees will not take another carrier sometimes, whether you tell them to or not. Whether you... So how do you guys see your loyalty program uh, shaking out? What's, uh, what's going to be more different? I, I'm looking to you for different innovative things that you can do with that kind of a program. Well, you know, ours is more of like a bounce back program where every time you fly, you gain points and then you can use those points for internet on the airplane or you can use it for to, to get a discount on your next flight. You know, that's kind of the way it's working now. And, you know, if we, you know, do a giveaway or we want to do something, we can just put points in the account. What's different about us is that when you book with us, yeah. you can find us on Google Flights, but, and you will be able to find us on the other guys, but we we require that everybody gives us their phone number or email. So we have contact with all our, our customers. Uh, they're not coming from, you know, a, a third party vendor where if we have a delay or a, an issue, we can't talk to your, to our customers. And so that's, that's, that's really important. 
Um, so we have, everyone has accounts set up and we go ahead and give them the points right off the bat. There's, they sign up for the program when they book us for the first time. Um, you know, we will launch a credit card next year like everybody else. And it's not sure. for everybody, but it's going to be great if you're kind of captive. To, we have people flying us every week that commute back and forth to work and go see family and, and are very, very, um, you know, married to us because of the service that we have. And, you know, I, there's just no other way to go if you're, you know, in Islip and you want to go to Charleston, uh, for example, or, or, you know, there's, there's, or if you're in uh, Westchester County and you want to go down to Vero Beach, it's us. So if you're going to do that eight, 10 times, if you're going to do that eight, 10 times a, a winter to go back and forth to your house as you go to work, then you get the card and, and yeah, there's tremendous advantages with it. So like I said, it's not with, for everybody, but it will be, really valuable to those people who, who are really captive to us. And I remember talking, you know, when I was trying to visualize this airline, I remember talking to somebody in, in, in Phoenix, um, they lived in, in, he lived in Appleton, Wisconsin, and he would come on Allegiant and fly That's to Mesa it. airport. And he bought a right. He bought a home that was 10 minutes from the Mesa airport. And when it got to be 40 below, he'd just book a ticket and go down and he did it 12 times a, a winter. And I said, would you ever fly anyone else? And he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> said, Why would I do that? You know, I'm not going to connect with Chicago in the wintertime or I'm not going to go to Atlanta. Exactly. But, you know, this is the only thing I do. And, you know, it didn't matter, you know, what kind of service it was. That was what he, you know, and that's why our MPS scores are so high because people, you know, love flying us because it's so convenient. Yeah, it's also a small town feel. You know, you've got a small town culture in your company. You're pretty well known for that. And But it's interesting. So your captive audience is not so much from the, the points and the massive girth of the th- of the big dogs, but it's really your locations. It's like, who else are you going to fly with? This is so convenient. So um, so analytics. Yeah, our traffic is, is stimulated. You know, we have it. Yeah. You know, we, we I, I would say that probably 90, 80% is new traffic uh, as opposed to stealing wow. from somebody. You know, yeah, you, uh, you know, the, some of the other LCCs, um, you know, they, they go into a big hub, and they'll fly between a really dense market, and they what we call skim. They go in there and they say, okay, try and match this fare. It'll cost you too much. We'll skim and we'll take everyone who wants to kind of put up with what we're doing. And you know, that's not really our game at all. We're we're, we're into flying. About ninety percent of our routes are where we don't have any non-stop competition. Yeah, it's smart. So you're really not. Uh, I usually ask, you know, who's your who do you hate on the program, competitor wise? It's really, I mean, the from a growth and innovation point of view, it seems like traffic analytics and lifestyle and trends and where people are wanting to come and go is is so critical for you because you yeah, you've we, got a, like with 150 fleet, you got to really handpick these routes per- perfectly. Yeah, we compete with the couch, really. I mean, that's yeah. kind of our competitor. <laughs> Yeah, you know, where they're all coming out, if uh, as you know, for all, many of you that travel regularly, the uh, I remember back in the day we used to make our kids wear, wear, fly in sport jackets, sometimes even a tie. And now pajamas are fine. So, um, but I digress. What? Um, let's shift a little bit to you know some of your personal angst that you've gone through. Um, but uh, before I do that, I just want to ask one last on the, on the business side. How do you view, you know, we look at build by borrow in terms of the stack of how do you do growth agenda? So borrowing the partnership side, if you, are you looking to announce lots of different partnerships? You know, for instance, some of your old carriers that you started, um, you know, obviously, um, you know, Azul would, would be a fascinating one, that whole South American thing. Um, you know, code sharing. It's kind of like old news now, but is that um, is that part of the new innovative track, or is that are you thinking of something different? It could be, you know, if we don't do something that anyone else does, then they we're not really competing. So, you know, it, it could we could bring them to new business. We've had conversations with a couple of different airlines, but it's it's on, on the margin. It's you know not yeah. that much. I think I would prefer you know what we've done at Azul, which I'm so proud of Azul. It's you know, uh, yeah, not a lot of people know that story. It's amazing what you did. Yeah, it's it's the most. I think it's the most important company that's been launched in Brazil in the last fifteen years. I mean, we we serve one hundred and seventy cities. Our nearest competitor serves fifty. Yeah. Uh, we so so we fly a hundred. We have a thousand flights a day, over a hundred thousand people a day. 
Uh, we doubled the air traffic in Brazil, become the largest airline in Brazil. And in addition to that, we have a logistics operation where before we got there and you ordered something online, it'd take you two weeks to get it. And now we get it to 4,800 communities in 48 hours or less. Yeah. So that that's that's really, I'm really proud of that, you know, life-saving stuff to, to people in the Amazon basin that was you know, five days by boat or us. Those are the it's two Transformative, operators. yeah, if it gets there at all. But we also have a vacation division down there, which is awesome. And the planes, because it's more corporate travel down there, the planes yeah. are available on Saturday. So on a Saturday, we'll fly 1,200 flights on a Saturday to unique uh, city pairs that we'll, we'll draw, take everyone out and come get them the following Saturday. And we've got hotels, accommodations, and in, in uh, you know, the largest uh, carrier in Porto Seguro, which is kind of the Fort Lauderdale of Brazil. So I think, you know, bringing them back to Breeze, we can do a lot of that because Saturday is not a really peak day for us either. Yeah. So once we get our flag status, I want to do a lot of packages to the DR and to Cancun and other places from cities that don't have nonstop service to Cancun. And some of them don't have uh, customs. Um, and so in those c- cities, maybe we fly to places where you can pre-clear. You know, places like the Bahamas or Aruba and other places. So that's, an, yeah, uh, that's very a, innovative. Yeah, I like that. A lot of opportunity. Um, that's how I started. I'm a package vacation guy from the very beginning. Yeah. <laughs> now, thanks for answering a question I hadn't even asked yet. So that's that's brilliant. Um, though, so the, the other thing I love about you is you've got a lot of personal stories that you know you're not afraid to share with people. You know we. I, you know, our team here mentors a lot of people. We have reboot fellows that work on the podcast that are here to learn. And and I'm not even sure where to start with you. You've got so many lessons learned. If you look at, you know, um, your your time at JetBlue and getting fired by an unenlightened board, as I would call it, I've lived through that as well. And it's always when the company's doing the best when stuff like that happens. No one ever knows the backstory. But love to learn um, – the audience would love to hear just, you know, what did you learn from JetBlue? And, and then and then as you took that to, you know, the different companies like Azul and, and, and you know, what what is it that you would really tell people to do, you know, kind of your younger self? But let's just start with, you know, it, usually out of pain comes growth. And then you've got this muscle memory that's just killer, right? You've got killer instincts around this industry. You know what to do. But it's the I find it's the painful lessons that really help the most. Absolutely. You know, let me just go back before that, because I think it, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, a couple lessons I learned, you know, the first, my first airline was called Morris Air and I sold it to Southwest Airlines. And the, the, the first lesson I learned in life was that my, it's not all about money. You know, I was uh-huh. 30 years old. I, I made $25 million in Southwest Airlines stock. I went to work at Southwest. And I was, this is before I realized I had ADD. So I'd go down to these management meetings and I would like blurt things out. Like, why are you doing it this way? <laughs> you know, we launched Tickleless uh, oh, Travel gosh. Southwest Airlines. We, you know, we, I did, you know our, my team did that. Yeah. So, you know, I ended up getting fired at Southwest, which was, you know, Herb just said, look, you know, you're driving everybody crazy here. And then I got this book called Driven to Distraction. My mom sent me yeah. and I was able to read through and there was 21 characteristics of someone with ADD. And the reason I bring this up, because most entrepreneurs have, I think, ADD. You know, if you're innovative, you're thinking outside the box, you they have do. that. And so, you it's know, I, I learned that and it was a big lesson for me and to be able to kind of learn that. And so um, I started talking about it a lot. And I, I, I can't tell you how many letters and emails and messages I've received from people saying, thanks so much. You know, my son has this and he's an example that, you know, you can really be successful. Right. You know, Ned Hallowell wrote that book, Driven to Distraction. And he wrote a book recently called ADHD 2.0. And he said, the boardrooms and the prisons are full of people with ADD. And it just depends on how you direct it and how you, you know, can channel that, that creativity. And and I think that played in a little bit to what happened to Joe Blue. You know, I was just busy running the company. I yeah. wasn't, you know, paying attention as much to the board as I should have been. And so I, you know, I was just, when we had this issue where it was called the Valentine's Day Massacre. We had our place stuck on the ground and somehow the board start, thought that, you know, somehow 
it was wasn't a that like, uh, that was it was like 17 country. or something, wasn't it? Or further it was, back? It was 2007. It was. Seven. I know there was a seven in there. <laughs> yeah, 2007. So, you know, I, I wasn't keeping up with them. So then they said, uh, you know, why don't you just be the chairman and let, we'll let the guy that screwed screwed up, you know, the Valentine's Day massacre be the CEO, which, you know, it turned out not to be. Happens the all the time. But yeah, it was just, it was just kind of their, you know, their, their knot hole they were looking through and they had, they just misread it. And, but, you know, from, from challenges come opportunities. And, you know, I, I wrote a letter, an email to all the people uh, at, at JetBlue when I left. And I said, look, you know, I've always told you, it's not really what happens to you. It's how you deal with it. Cause we'd gone through nine 11 together, you know, at JetBlue. Yes. And I had a lifetime dream to go to Brazil and start an airline because Ever since I was I was born in Brazil, my dad was a missionary there, and they went back as a journalist. And then I served there as a missionary, and I just wanted to make a difference in that country. So I think it was actually, you know, in hindsight, the right thing for me to go to Brazil because I think what I did there was you know, with a team of people that I took with me, a lot of them from JetBlue, uh, has done so much good for that country, you know, and and so much good. So. You know, a lot of lessons there. You know, one of them is understand your ADD. Now, at Azul, I'm the controlling shareholder, so I can't be fired. So that's good. I fixed that, and I learned. Yeah, from it that. sounds like you engineered that in there. Very smart. See, you got to yeah, learn from your smart. learn from your mistakes. But also, <laughs> if, if bad things happen, you know, you got to learn from it. You got to pick yourself exactly. up, and dust yourself off, and go do something great. You know that quote from the book. I, I actually love that quote. It's like you know the. You know, th th there's ADD in prisons and boardrooms. Actually, boardrooms or prisons can be uh, interchanged and mixed up sometimes. <laughs> Understand which one are actually, or which one you're actually in. Nothing, nothing against prisons and boardrooms, but it's it's a tough thing to run a company and bring along a board at the same time in a massively growing company because you're going to hit hiccups, and if they're not there to support you, and Absolutely. to me, it, it's like. That even in your current role at Breeze, although I know you've got much different controls and and better investors that are friends, but what do you look for when you're bringing leaders in? You know, leaders that will be visionary, that you know care, that are passionate. You can't teach passion. Uh, no. Do you like them to have passion for the uh, travel and leisure industry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it, putting yourself in your customer's shoes, figuring out how you can do things innovative, yeah. uh, different, more innovative, uh, you know, and just, like I said, you cannot teach passion and, and, and also people who compliment my weaknesses. You know, I, I can be visionary and I can think of things, but if I can't, you know, if I'm not the best person necessarily to execute on all that stuff. And, you know, one of the criticisms I get from the management team sometimes is it's not that simple. And I'm like, yes, it is. It's that simple. So, it's not like we're running an airline. Oh, wait, we are. Uh oh, we are. <laughs> yes. So, you know, it, it's uh, seriously there. There are so many tech entrepreneurs that they think they have such a hard company. And I'm like, go run an airline. Yeah. Good luck. A lot, a lot, so, there's a lot. There. Yeah, the things you pull off, you have to have a certain level of exactitude, is what Fred Smith used to say. And you need you, which is the visionary leader that's taking it somewhere else to a, a land of profitability that is not based on the old model. But the reason I asked is about leadership is like, it seems like the travel and leisure industry, however we want to define it, uh, we won't say aviation, but it needs a whole new influx of next generation of people that want to work in good paying jobs. And I don't see that as much as tech. Everyone is attracted to tech and, you know, maybe healthcare, maybe fintech, just all different types of industries, right? And yeah, how do you kind of get the resurgence of not just you, but the whole industry where it's like, hey, people want to be part of this next generation? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think you have to build a company where people feel good about going to work. You know, they, Southwest, they, 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 Southwest did. They, they cleaned the clock of the airlines back in the day, culturally. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you just... You know, I, I, you know, Brazil is a different, you know, animal because uh, if you yeah. get a job at Brazil, you never leave. Our attrition rate is virtually zero point two percent per year. Uh, everybody just loves working for that company, and it's easier there because there's just not as many good companies as as you have here. So I walk around saying, "Is this the best job you've ever had?" And that's, you know, our goal is to make it the best job you ever had. And so, you know, 
it takes a lot of work to do that. It's not something that you can just wake up in the morning and have it happen. You have to really focus on communicating with your people, you know, listening to what they have to say. I host a call weekly with all of our pilots because, you know, they have a lot of places they can go to work and, you know, they have a lot of questions and they have a lot of concerns. And so, you know, at knowing that not, I host the call, but I have everyone in leadership that touches that area or, or there too to listening and, and learning. So smart, it's not smart, probably yeah. something that's done anywhere in the in the world, but it's something that I just felt was important. And so you know, times change, and you have to you kind of adjust to that to that new reality. And you think you can scale this? Um, w- w- it's a very refreshing culture. Do you think you can scale it? to a multi, you know, gazillion dollar company? The I think so. I, mean, I, know you know, can, I know you can scale the company, that I know. Well, Southwest has. You know, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of Southwest and what they've yeah, done. And it's a good model. They've stubbed their toe recently, but, you know, they've always been about their people, you know, from, yes. the, from the very beginning. And they've got a motivated workforce. And, you know, they've got some issues now getting some union contracts done. But, you know, they, they, they've been around for a heck of a long time. And they're huge. And, you know, to, to be able to kind of do what they've done gives you hope that you can do the same. Right. Exactly. Any uh, parting advice you'd give to aspiring uh, aviators that maybe want to get into your space, maybe work for you? Well, I think, you know, it, it depends on where you want to be. I think if you're if you like to fix things, there is a tremendous opportunity being a technician in this business. If you like to you know, work on airplanes and, and that's, that's pretty exciting. You know, aviation is different because there are people that are so passionate about aviation. There's just yeah. something about it that gets in your blood. Yeah. Um, be it a pilot or a technician or, you know, someone who's working in our schedule planning area, they are really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really ad- addiction, but, you know, just, if you want to be a pilot, you know, I've got a, uh, you know, my, my stepdaughter has a boyfriend who just got hired at Spirit, you know, and it was better for him to to be over there and started at 16 years old. And by 19, he was a certified flight instructor and he's uh, hit his 1500 hours. And now he's going to be based, uh, you know, in a place where he lives and be flying, go right from a Cessna to a, to a A320, which is pretty exciting for him. So there's opportunities, but you got to work really hard. You got to stay positive and stay focused, and and uh, it's a great business to be in. Uh, but um, you know, it, and, and if it gets in your blood, it's hard to to get it out. Yeah, that's what I've seen. Thanks, David. Appreciate you being on. You've been listening to David Newman, who is the CEO, Chairman of Breeze Airways, and um, it's just great to uh, see such a uh, refreshing leadership. Um, style out there in this industry. So uh, we wish you well. 